Right, well, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm just here to test that the PA works. Um, uh, my name's Charlie Wynne Evans. Um, welcome here to DECAT this evening. I appear to be wearing various hats. I'm the head of our employment law practice and a partner here at DECAT. Um, I'm also in charge of our pro bono efforts as a firm. DECAT as a firm is very committed to uh, pro bono across its international network, so we're absolutely delighted to be able to host this event tonight. Um, I'm also a vice chair of the Industrial Law Society, and I think that's why somebody persuaded me that I should go to the budgetary powers that be to say, can we host this event tonight? And all it is, all that I'm here for is to say, A, does the PA work? Can you hear me at the back? Um, B, welcome to, to DECA for this evening, and um, we're very, very pleased to be able to host this event. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Um, I'm Safi Ashtiani. I'm the chair of the Equal Rights Trust, and I'm also an honorary lifetime vice president of the Industrial Law Society. So it's with great pleasure that we've been able to come together to partner in this um, event for us tonight. Um, this is the second Bob Heppel Award evening, and we're here to commemorate him. But before I get going, um, there's a little bit of housekeeping and so on that I, I want to talk about, about the structure of the evening. Um, the evening kicks off with the award to our, um, to, to, which we are delighted this year to be giving to Dr. Anna Lawson from Leeds, and is sitting right in front here, and uh, she is uh, accompanied by her extremely important friend. On my left is Lauren, who is our um, British Sign Language signer, and will be talking to us um, throughout the ceremony. For those who are deaf, if you put up your hands, she will make sure that you, um, you're able to see her properly and to be able to um, uh, go through, participate properly in the proceedings. And we have a few transcripts available of our keynote speech um, from Kate O'Brien, so people who would like a transcript as well, um, then please indicate that to Charlotte, the important person with the camera, and she will be able to make sure we have them. Um, the intention is that after the award ceremony, um, Anna will say a few words and will speak a little bit about her thoughts on um, disability um, law and on, from an international perspective, uh, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes, I think. And then uh, we move to Kate, who will speak to us um, about her thoughts on the impact of a constitution, the constitutional law framework for equality and employment protection rights. Um, so before we get to the important part of the evening, I just want to say a little bit more about your two hosts tonight. The Equal Rights Trust is uh, an independent organization that works to combat discrimination and to promote equality as a, a, a freestanding anti-discrimination right. Um, we were set up at a time when the equality movement was fragmented and many organizations were looking at discrimination from a single focus, either on the basis of age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or other characteristics. We've spent the last nine years since we were set up, and Bob was absolutely instrumental in helping it set up right at the beginning, uh, looking at a holistic framework for, um, a holistic and unified framework for promoting um, approaches to equality and non-discrimination. And today we think we're, we're very proud to be part of a growing movement of organizations and coalitions across the world looking at equality from this particular standpoint. Our work is global. I think at the last count we're working in about 40 countries, um, both at regional and international levels through advocacy, litigation, research, and supporting equality movements generally. We work in partnership with in individual human rights defenders, community-based organizations, NGOs, UN bodies and governments, and, uh, and the like. And during the drinks, you probably saw some of the slides just describing our work, and you'll be able to see some of our, the product of our work outside, and many of our key staff are here if you want to talk a little bit more about us. Um, I should say that this evening is dedicated to the memory of Bob, and we've set up an internship program which we are seeking to fund in his name. Our work is not work which is wildly popular among corporates. Um, the fundraising um, uh, perspective for, for people working in this area where we're quite challenging to governments and when we speak truth to power can all itself be quite challenging. So without giving much more away, we will also be maybe looking for a little bit of support from you at the end of the formal session and before we break for supper. Turning now to the Industrial Law Society, the Industrial Law Society is a wonderful um, multi um, partite membership organization, which is entirely UK based, but which also has strong links with European uh, colleagues and compatriots across the continental spread. 
It's an organization which consists of practicing lawyers, judges, academics, trade unionists, employers, students, anybody who is interested in the, in the development of employment and equality law um, related to the world of work. Um, Bob Heppel was among the first editors of the Industrial Law Journal, of which copies can be seen at the, the back of the room next to the, um, uh, the cloister's um, table, and uh, edited it for some years before he became an industrial tribunal chair back in the 70s. The ILS runs a program, in addition to um, publishing the Industrial Law Journal, it runs a program of evening, evening meetings and two annual conferences, one of them an amazingly good residential one with a disco on the Saturday night <laughs> in Oxford, this year to be on the 16th to 18th of September. More information about the ILS at the back and more information also about our sponsors, Deckerts, to which we are extremely grateful for hosting this evening for us and enabling us to bring all these lovely colleagues together um, in a way which, you know, which is properly funded, and also to Cloisters, who've made a significant contribution to our Equality Award to make this evening possible. So why did we establish this award? I've nearly finished. I'm getting to the important part, which is going to be Anna and Kate. We established this last year in honour of Bob. Bob had just become the Employment right, the Equality, uh, the Equal Trusts, um, Equal Rights Trust President, having stepped down as chair, a duty that he handed on to me. And we wanted to honour him and his amazing work for the world of equality, and particularly equality, equality activists, by establishing an award to honour people in his name. The first year we had um, two winners, Pragna Patel from um, the uh, Savo um, Women's Rights Group and an amazing man from Argentina um, who worked in gender identity and, and uh, trans issues, and it was a fantastic evening. I didn't think it could be bettered, but we have the most wonderful um, awardee tonight, uh, Dr. Dr. Lawson, who is based in Leeds. Um, Dr. Lawson was the first, if she doesn't mind me saying this, blind female professor of law in the UK. She teaches human rights, equality law and disability rights at Leeds, where she's director of the Centre for Disability Studies. And, it, and she's an international and widely recognised leader in the field of disability studies, drawing increasingly interest and research from all around the world. She's also co-coordinator of the university's newly established Disability Law Hub, which brings together one of the largest groups of disability law academics in the whole world. So her focus is both local and very much global. Her research focuses on disability, equality, and human rights in the international and European domestic arena. She's worked closely with the European Commission, among many of us, not a dirty word, <laughs> particularly in her capacity as a board member of the EU Academic Network of Experts on Disability. She's worked with the EU Agency on Fundamental Rights and Secretary of Council of Europe, and she is currently a member of the Statutory Disability Committee of the Equality and Human Rights Commission here in the UK. But I could say much more about her. We've put a little, um, little CVs on your chairs. I won't say any more because I think I, the time should be given to the people who are important tonight. I'd like to ask Anna to come up and be this year's recipient of the Bob Heppel Award for Equality. It's a sort of piece of floating glass in the shape of a sail. I hope you like it too. In the shape of a sail. And when we chose this as the symbol of the Bob Heppel Awards, and we hoped that Bob would be here for many years to, 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 um, to hand these awards, we thought of freedom and liberty and being able to sail freely, free movement across the seas. We had no idea it was all going to become a contentious issue. <laughs> and we commissioned a, a UK artist um, to design and make it. And I, I'm just going to say something about her because she's able to be with her with us here tonight. Wendy, I'm going to embarrass you. Would you mind standing up? No, not you, Daddy David. Not you, Daddy. Wendy Newhofer is the artist who designed and made and thought of this award for us.
Thank you. Can I take you to work so that we can see and come over to these big screens? So good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being here, for supporting this event, for that wonderful, wonderful um, piece of um, <laughs> sculpture. It's particularly fitting because the law school is housed in what's, what we call the, the Liberty Building, so it, it fits absolutely perfectly. So thank you very, very much. Um, it's wonderful to be in a room full of people like you, who have contributed so much in so many different ways to embedding the values of equality, inclusion and tolerance in our world. It would be wonderful at any time to be in a room with you all, but it's particularly wonderful at this turbulent and troubling time in our history. I've tried really hard to find words to express how much receiving this award means to me, but I know that I have failed completely miserably. <laughs> it really is the greatest of honours, particularly as it comes from an organisation with the global reach and significance of the Equal Rights Trust. I never cease to be amazed at the work that you managed to achieve all over the world through what's a relatively small organisation, but you certainly punch way above, way above your weight. <laughs> And of course, it means a huge amount to me to receive an award which has the name of Professor Sir Bob Heppel on it. He truly is one of the giants of our equality law landscape. I was reminded of that when I looked at the interviews that he gave, which are on the Clare, um, the, the Squire Library website, um, which really are worth a read. But you come away with a sense of renewed awe at how much just one person was able to achieve in a lifetime. It's completely ridiculous. But despite his colossal achievements and contributions to the world, to the UK and South Africa in particular, all the tributes to him refer to his humility. And that's something that I noticed about him when on the few occasions that I had the, the honour to meet him. The first time I met him, he said to me that he had a great deal still to learn about disability rights, but that he'd found an excellent teacher in his grandson, Joshua Heppel, who um, is passionate about disability rights and is in the audience here today. So maybe you could show yourself, Josh. Oh, yeah. You're there. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, my own learning about disability began at the age of seven when I started to lose my sight. It was a gradual process and one which changed my educational experience. Previously I'd thoroughly enjoyed school, felt quite comfortable about being near the top of the class and then suddenly it became difficult to read, difficult to see the blackboard, difficult to engage with various other um, tools of the educational system because they weren't accessible. So I went to a special school, long, long way from the little village in North Wales where I come from. But the challenges continued because it was very much a special school for partially sighted children. The idea being that everybody should be able to read through magnifying glasses. And because my sight was deteriorating, that soon became very difficult and impossible. So, those were some of the barriers I experienced. That school was a great learning environment because I had friends there who, although it was a school for partially sighted children, had other forms of impairment, but ended up in our school because they didn't fit into the mainstream. So I learned about the types of barrier and exclusion they were facing as well. So I want to just mention three friends in particular. One had epilepsy. It began when she was 14. 
And suddenly her school started to treat her as a distraction and a danger. So she was, she ended up with us. Another friend was a wheelchair user. She ended up in the same class as me, the one that was in the grammar stream and did O levels and A levels. But for two years in that same school, she'd been put into a class where children weren't taught, prepared for doing any exams at all. The assumption being that because she was a wheelchair user, she also had learning difficulties. It took her two years to, to um, overcome that prejudice. The third friend had cerebral palsy and she was rejected by her family. So a boarding school, a special school was a convenient option for, for somewhere for her to be. So while experiences like this made me determined to try to make a difference, it wasn't until I'd worked for an academic for 10 years in the broad field of property, although I did focus on equality even there, um, that I resolved to try to work on equality on a more full-time basis. And I actually thought it would be too difficult to make that shift within academia. So I applied for a job with the Disability Rights Commission, and that's where I met Caroline Gooding, who many of you will know. She didn't give me that job. She gave it to Cathy Cassidy, who's here today, <laughs> and has a knack for stealing my jobs. <laughs> they couldn't go to a better person. Um, but Caroline did ask me to do various pieces of research for the Disability Rights Commission to gather evidence and analysis that would then inform the, um, the law reform initiatives that the Disability Rights Commission wanted to work on. And that was incredibly fulfilling and was a brilliant transition for me within academia to the world of disability research. So thank you, Caroline. <laughs> um, so I've been working on disability and equality for the last 16 years since um, the 21st century began. And it's been a really exciting time to work in this area. There have been various developments at national level, which were very positive up till 2010. Since then they've been slightly less positive, but <laughs> still um, an exciting time to be around. But what's been very exciting, I think, has been the supranational development of the subject over that period. So in 2006, the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities after a drafting process which had in an unprecedented involvement of civil society, particularly disabled people and their organisations. And I was very lucky to be involved in the last of the ad hoc sessions when many of the articles of that treaty were adopted. That um, convention has been widely ratified and has been a really powerful catalyst to hold up what's happening to disabled people around the world and think about ways in which law and policy can be changed to enhance equality basically, to, to ensure that disabled people are able to participate as equals in society. <coughs> and I've been particularly impressed by the work that happens in countries where these initiatives are not so easy to, to make happen. So I know the Equal, Equal Rights Trust is working in some of those countries. And um, people like Stephen Hallett from China Vision, I think, deserve huge huge acclaim for the, the um, support that they give to activists on the ground in, in China and various other countries. Um, so, turning to the regional level, <laughs> developments within the EU have been particularly exciting. The EU took part in the negotiations for this UN convention um, and was a really powerful force in driving up the standards and um, the, the drafting of the articles that we now have. It was a powerful ally of disabled people in those negotiations. 
The CRPD is the only UN human rights treaty that the EU itself has ratified. And we're now beginning to see the impact of that in the mainstreaming of disability rights issues into many strands of EU law. So references to the need to respect the right to independent living, accessibility, as well as non-discrimination appear in funding instruments, in instruments dealing with the internal market and procurement, as well as and, and transport, as well as um, the specific non-discrimination um, directives. I've had the privilege of working with some of the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels, who we've heard so much about <laughs> in the last few weeks, on various issues, including the proposal for a European Accessibility Act. And I've witnessed at first hand the, sorry, <laughs> the um, commitment and completely selfless dedication which some of those people have. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> There's also the Council of Europe, and our law has been enriched by um, the use of the Human Rights Act, um, which has allowed us to use, to draw on the European Convention on Human Rights in a way we never were able to do before. So, our law has been greatly enriched by these supranational developments. And equality, as the Equal Rights Trust knows more than anybody, isn't an issue that should be confined within borders. It's, a, it's an international issue. And if we're serious about it, focusing on equality within one country alone is not going to be, um, is, is going to feel like cheating the rest of the world. Like many other people working in universities, not least Bob Pepper himself, we in Leeds are determined that the work that we do contributes to enhancing social justice. We can't, universities can't achieve that on their own. We need collaboration with campaigning organisations, with human rights organisations, with le the legal profession, with business and with service providers and with policy makers. One of the defining features of the Centre for Disability Studies in Leeds has been the collaborations it's established in research, especially with disabled people's organisations. Now, the Disability Law Hub, which was launched in a, in a soft way <laughs> two months ago, so it's very new, um, gives us the chance to build on, on some of these collaborations but to expand them by um, really trying to develop our connections with the legal profession and um, other organisations more fully than we've been able to before. And to ensure that those collaborations feed into our teaching and the student experience as well as the research. And we've got very exciting plans to do that starting with the next academic year. On the Disability Law Hub, I just want to add that a year and a half ago I was the only person in the law school in Leeds working on disability. Since then we've had five new appointments, two of which are at professorial level, and these are appointments which are which link us directly into the legal profession and human rights organizations. Um, and other colleagues who've worked in other areas of law have developed the disability side of their work, so they're joining us too. So this is very exciting for us, and it positions us really well for um, work at the global level as well as at the local level, which um, Safia mentioned at the beginning. But what I want to say is that none of this would have been possible without the leadership vision diplomacy and incredibly hard work of 
our head of school, Professor Alistair Mullis, who's, who's also here tonight. So thank you, Alistair. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> I think this might be a bit masochistic, but I want to come back to Brexit <laughs> and, and equality and point you to, if you haven't seen it already, there's a really excellent discussion of this on the Equal Rights Trust website from a few days ago, um, which draws attention to some of the equality risks of leave, attendance on leaving the EU there are also risks to universities, including those working on equality issues. A lot of research funding is provided through the EU at the moment. And also the EU creates all sorts of schemes and opportunities to facilitate collaboration between people from different countries. So it exposes us to new ideas, new people from different systems and different countries. And that's incredibly enriching for all, all of us involved in thinking about new ways of making things work. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot at stake in the renegotiation of the relationship between the UK and the EU. There are implications that go way beyond the UK. I just, want us to, I'm sure you'll agree with me, to, to guard against the assumption of superiority, which was something that we encountered a lot in the lead up to the vote. The, the assumption that the UK is better than any other country on equality, so we don't need to learn from, engage with, or collaborate with anyone else. And we also have an urgent need to tackle the increase in xenophobia and the anti-migrant rhetoric and harassment and threats that have emerged over the last few months. And I think it's instructive to remember that Professor Sir Bob Heppel himself arrived in this country as a migrant, as a refugee, fleeing from a country in which he'd been kept in solitary confinement for 90 days and facing the death penalty. So the next few months and years, while, while these discussions happen, are going to be busy ones for all of us involved in equality, in which we'll all need to be vigilant about things at home as well as things further afield. And to close, my enormous thanks again to the Equal Rights Trust, Cloisters, the Industrial Law Society, and everybody else who's made this award possible. I don't feel worthy of it, and I suspect nobody who is awarded it does. But for me, it's, it will always be a reminder of the importance of this work and the fact that there's a lot more of it to be done. And I want to finish with the words I found from um, the tribute that Sandra Fredman gave to Bob Heppel. Words that he said to her a week before he died last summer which was, which were, whatever happens, we must never stop working for justice and equality. Thank you very much. Goodness me, um, we didn't need any um, reminder of what a wonderful, wonderful awardee we have tonight. Thank you very, very much indeed. And I was really privileged to be here to, to listen to that, both from the personal perspective and also from the intellectual perspective. Um, fantastic work you're doing. Um, I move now to Kate O'Regan, Justice O'Regan, who has uh, recently stepped down as um, uh, a member of the South African Constitutional Court, to which she was appointed in 1994, where I think she was the youngest judge ever appointed, and at the time, one of only two women judges. 
Um, Kate is a towering academic. She did her PhD here in London, I think, on the right to strike. She is an, was an extremely effective practitioner working in Johannesburg on a whole range of issues, particularly for the um, African National Congress. And she's been an absolutely towering judge. Um, her intellectual, intellectual breadth, I think, is only matched by her humanity. Her judgments are very wide ranging. We have cases like Dawood on the constitutional protection for family life, cases on cases like Bato Star on the whole test of reasonableness and the um, interplay between um, ministerial and judicial um, judgments. And then the case which perhaps is quite topical, um, Richter against the Minister of Home Affairs about the rights of South Africans to vote from overseas, the right which would have been quite good for some British people. We mustn't keep on harping about that. Um, Kate tonight is going to talk about uh, labor protection, uh, equality law, and this whole field of protections from the perspective of, uh, from the constitutional perspective, and of course, rooted in her extreme expertise on South African law. Um, Kate, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Safia. It is really a privilege and a pleasure to be able to speak to you this evening in memory of Bob Heppel on the second occasion of the award of a Bob Heppel Award. Bob's abiding interests were employment law and equality, and so it's particularly fitting, as Safia has said, that this should be a joint meeting of the Equal Rights Trust and the Industrial Law Society uh, in his memory. I want to start by congratulating Dr. Lawson on her award of the, of the Bob Heppel Award. She may have said she did not feel she was worthy of it, but I think all of us who heard her this evening have absolutely no doubt that she is indeed worthy of it. And I'd like you to give her another round of applause. <laughs> if a dog can't clap his hands, he's got a bark. <laughs> So I first met Bob in the 1980s when I was studying for my PhD here at the London School of Economics in relation to strike law. And I um, have knew him uh, until his really untimely death last year in September. And he really was a, a mentor to me uh, and somebody who I admired enormously. In a week that has really been a turbulent week, it's sometimes very comforting to look back on a life like Bob's. Bob knew turbulence, and I'm going to just briefly give you a, an outline of that. And through it all, he maintained a clear vision, a clear set of principles, and he worked towards them. He, he didn't panic easily. He wasn't somebody who wore his heart on his sleeve, but he was steady and calm and clear. And it seems to me that in turbulent times, those qualities are really important. So Bob was born in Johannesburg, the son of a trade unionist and a Labour Party politician. He obtained his law degree, uh, graduating at the top of his class from the University of the Witwatersrand in 1957. And he then taught law at the, at the law school at the Witwatersrand. But during these years, he became active in politics. As a member of the Congress of Democrats, which was an alliance partner of the African National Congress, and also very involved in working for the South African Congress of Trade Unions, another partner in the Congress Alliance as the group of liberation movements were, were known in South Africa. He was arrested together with six other leaders of the Congress Alliance at Lily's Leaf Farm in Johannesburg on the 11th of July, 1963, detained under the notorious 90-day detention law, laws and held in solitary confinement. After those three months, he was charged with sab sabotage, as Anna has mentioned, that carried the death penalty. Shortly after, he was released and on the basis that he would turn state witness, but never intending to turn state witness, he fled the country with his wife, leaving behind their two small children who joined them some months later in the United Kingdom. Bob told this story in a very moving memoir, which I highly recommend to you, published in 2013, Young Man with a Red Tie, a memoir of Mandela and a failed revolution. So Bob's story in the United Kingdom will, of course, be more familiar to British labor lawyers. 
Upon his arrival, he became a graduate student at Clare College in Cambridge, where he wrote a groundbreaking dissertation on race, jobs, and the law in Britain. He was called to the bar in 1966, but continued also to work as an academic, first at Nottingham, then at Cambridge, then the University of Can Canterbury at Kent, at UCL, and in 1993, he was appointed Master of Clare College, Cambridge. He was the author of many important textbooks, a case book on tort, a book on individual employment law with Paul O'Higgins in 1971, a book on discrimination and the limits of the law with Erica Shizak, and of course his most recent work, Equality, the New Legal Framework. Bob was always committed to an interdisciplinary approach to the study of labor law. He always thought that it was important to understand law in practice. And he achieved this partly by doing. He served as a chair of an industrial tribunal, as Safia has member, mentioned, a member of the Commission for Racial Equality, a member of the United Nations Administrative Tribunal, and of course, he was co-author of the report of the reform of discrimination law, which led to the adoption of the Equality Act in 2010. He also served on governance board of a range of non-governmental organizations, including the European Roma Rights Center, and thus the Equal Rights Trust. Throughout, Bob remained quiet spoken, thoughtful, and a good listener, but always a firm leader when needed. But there was a third aspect to Bob's work, which is perhaps less well known in the United Kingdom, and that is his work on labor reform in Southern Africa in the 1990s and early years of the 21st century. At the request of the ILO, Bob drafted a labor co code for Namibia when it became independent of South Africa. Described by Halston Cheadle, one of South Africa's la leading labor lawyers, as a very elegant code that unfortunately was rewritten in the convoluted prose that characterized the drafting style of the apartheid government. But fortunately, some 14 years later, the Namibian la labor legislation was again redrafted, by and large on the basis of the principles and clarity of Bob's initial draft. And having served as a judge in Namibia for the last seven years, I've had the good fortune to, to interpret that legislation on several occasions. Bob also served as one of the three advisors appointed by the ILO to advise the drafting team to redraft South Africa's labor law soon after the first democratic elections were held in 1994. Halson also recalls that Bob emphasized the centrality of a good dispute resolution system with a first tier that would mediate and arbitrate all disputes. This system became our Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration and then we established a second and third tier labor court and labor appeal court respectively. So Bob's great contribution to the South African struggle against apartheid in the 1950s and 60s, as well as his contribution to legislative reform in the 1990s, was, I'm delighted to say, recognized in South Africa in 2014 with, when the Order of Lutuli Gold, an extremely rare honor, was conferred upon him by the president in recognition of his contributions. So that life tells you how much a human being can deal with turbulence, move on in very difficult times. And I think that was one of the things that I found about Bob that was enormously valuable to me. I'm going to turn now briefly to talk about the South African Constitution and Labor Law. And as we all know, those of us who all cut our teeth on Otto Kahn Freund, you can't really understand labor law without understanding a bit of the context. So I'm going to talk briefly about South African labor history, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the current labor market, then a little bit about our legislative scheme, and then talk about the Constitution. And I'm conscious when I do this that this is a, this is a whole system that seems extremely different to the way in which labor law operates in Britain. And in many ways it is. But I, what I learned from studying um, or doing my PhD here in, the, in London in the mid-1980s was never accept your, expect your system to stay the same. Things change dramatically, and we learn so much from looking at other legal systems. Indeed, one of the great blessings for South Africa in the aftermath of apartheid was the great outpouring of solidarity and friendship and expert advice uh, that we benefited from. And that is particularly apparent in the field of labor law, I think. So contemporary South African labor law can't be understood without a brief grasp of our history. And of course, that history is a history of colonialism, institutionalized racism, 
exclusion. And it was present in the labor market in South Africa from the start. In many ways, our system of labor law, which is a system of industrial level bargaining, was introduced in the aftermath of the Rand Revolt of 1922, when white mine workers declared a general strike as a result of wage cuts on the, under, on the mines under the notorious slogan, workers of the world unite and fight for a white South Africa. The strike developed into a rebellion that ended with aerial bombings of portions of Johannesburg launched by President Jan Smuts and the execution of most of the leaders of the revolt. But in the aftermath of that re revolt, Jan Smuts lost his seat or lost, lost the election and his, and his presidency and the new coalition government enacted an Industrial Conciliation Act, which largely was rooted in racist division of labor. It provided for the establishment of industrial councils as the core institution of collective bargaining. That means collective bargaining works on an industry or sectoral basis, and wages are then set for that entire industry or sector, much as happens in Sweden and Germany. But the only people, workers who could be members of industrial councils were white workers. Even though those uh, agreements that were made at the industrial councils were then extended to African workers. That system effectively stayed in place until the 1980s. The racist exclusion of African workers was achieved in effect by denying them the right to join registered trade unions because industrial councils were made up of registered trade unions on the one hand and registered employers or employer federations on the other. And if you were not allowed to join a registered trade union, you would in effect have no representative representation in the industrial council. That changed in 1979 when the government permitted African workers to join registered trade unions for the first time. And this change too was spurred in some ways like the old 1924 legislation had been by, by industrial strikes. Uh, these by African workers in particular in Durban in 1973. And what followed then was the emergence of the black trade union movement, particularly spurred on from the early 1980s. An enormous amount of rich debates attended on the emergence of the black trade union movement. Should unions be general unions or should they be organized along industry lines? Should they be non-racial or should they be for black workers only? Should the, what should the emerging trade unions relationship be with the uh, liberation movements in exile and with political parties generally? There was a very hot debate about the need for independent working class formations and similarly, there was a vibrant debate about the relationship between the use of law and the use of organization on the shop floor. Some of those debates have real echoes in debates in the United Kingdom um, across the 20th century. Some of them were reformed, uh, were resolved in the mid-1980s with the formation of Kasatu, South Africa's largest union federation, which brought all these unions together into one union and which very firmly organized under the principle of one industry, one union. So we saw a huge pattern of amalgamation. And effectively what followed was the taking over of industrial councils by black registered uh, trade unions, although many of them would have been non-racial. By and large, black workers became the dominant voice in industrial councils. In 1991, Kasatu went into an alliance with the African National Congress after its unbanning and with the South African Communist Party, what we call in South Africa the Tripartite Alliance, an alliance which exists to this day, although noticeable cracks are developing in it. First, there's been a major split in Kasatu, with one of its most radical and largest unions breaking away, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa. And secondly, with increasing unhappiness, both in Kasatu, perhaps less so now since the breakaway of NUMSA, but within the South African Communist Party with the leadership of our current president, President Zuma. So that's our history, very turbulent, very complex. And if we then turn to the labor market in South Africa, there really are three things I want to say about it. We're an outlier in many ways and very unfortunate outlier. If you look at our unemployment rate, on the recorded rate, it's 25%, but that's a dramatic undercount. Many people say it's higher at 36, 37%. That is an almost unchanging figure in the last 20 years, and economists generally do not predict a significant change in it. The second is that we have an, arguably the world's highest rate of inequality. 
Latest estimates put the Guinea coefficient at 0.69, considerably higher than Brazil, particularly after the Bolsa Familia and various other forms of conditional grant have changed the Guinea coefficient situation in Brazil. South Africa has only seen moderate economic growth since the 1990s, around about 3% per annum, which has yielded modest poverty reduction, but which has not undone um, our levels of inequality. One of the factors that has led to the reduction in poverty has been the cash transfer system introduced by government. So government now spends 4% of GDP on social grants, and just under 17 million South Africans, that's a third of our overall population, receive a social grant of one sort or another. So that's the second way we're an outlier. First was high levels of unemployment, and the second was this um, very high levels of inequality. And the third is the rate of unionization. Over, overall union density in South Africa stands at 37.5%, which you could compare to about 16.5% in OECD countries in 2014. Um, there's a sharp difference in levels of unionization in South Africa between the public and private sector, just as there is in many developed uh, countries. Public sector unionization has climbed sharply. It now stands at about 70%, or about 1.4 million members. Private sector unionization, while still high in global terms, is much lower at 24.4% or 1.8 million members, and it's declined quite sharply from 35% in the mid-1990s. There's an exception in the mining industry where mining is very highly unionized at a rate of about 80%, but that is formal sector workers. With the growth of casualization with outsourcing, you see a lower rate of unionization. So, um, Overall, then, this is not a benevolent picture of our labor market. High rates of unemployment, um, very high rates of inequality, although these are counted to some extent by the high levels of unionization. But the effect of this is that labor market policy and labor law are at the heart of the most um, vigorous political debates in South Africa. Our legislative framework, then turning to the third issue, is really the Labor Relations Act, which Bob talked about, uh, which Bob was involved in drafting and which I talked about. It regulates collective bargaining, it regulates the right to strike, termination of employment, creates a floor of rights, and so it's the most important piece of legislation by far. But by far the, over, the overarching principle is in fact our constitution. And that means I come now lastly just to talk briefly about the constitution. So our constitution is a very broad constitution in terms of rights. It prohibits unfair discrimination on an open-ended list of 17 grounds, which include race, sex, sexual orientation, disability, religion, and language. And unusually for a constitution, it binds not only the state, but private individuals and organizations as well. The constitution is directly binding on individuals in this regard. And then we have a section of our constitution which deals with labor rights. And that entrenches the right of workers to join, form uh, trade unions, to participate in strikes. It um, entrenches the right of collective bargaining subject to legislation. And it also entrenches the rights of employer organizations to form and join employer or, or employers to form and join employer organizations. So we have a constitutional right which recognizes both collective bargaining and uh, strikes. So if you look back at the lit litigation over the last 20 years, it actually got off to quite a slow start. In the first seven years, we only had five cases concerning labor law, and two of them concerned dis discrimination law. One was a case concerning discrimination on the grounds of HIV AIDS status, not in our list in 1996, perhaps not surprisingly, given the, that HIV, our HIV crisis really only hit a couple of years later. Um, but the court upheld the right of not to be discriminated against on the grounds of HIV. And the second one was a case on citizenship. And again, the court upheld the claim um, that uh, there should not be discrimination on the grounds of citizenship. But the next seven years, so effectively from 19, 2001 to 2008, saw a big jump in the number of cases. And in that time, what happened was that the court held that the interpretation of lab labor legislation was a constitutional matter because it, the Labor Relations Act had to be interpreted in a manner that was consistent with the rights in the Constitution. And the next seven years has seen a further jump 
um, up till the end of 2015. Um, and many, many of the cases now that are coming before the court are collective uh, cases around collective labor law. So time only permits me to talk about two aspects of it. And the first one I want to talk about is one that people don't tend to think about when they think about a constitution. And that's the duty of coherence in constitutional law. And then the second one I'm going to talk about is the right to strike, um, because that is obviously a substantive right, right at the heart of a constitutional framework. One of the difficulties when you create a constitution is to ensure that the constitution works through your legal system in a coherent way. And that has been particularly difficult in the area of labor law. One of the reasons for this is that the Labor Relations Act was actually drafted before our constitution. So there's not a neat fit between the Labor Relations Act and the constitution. And I think the court has made some good progress in solving that. It would help had glad in my heart if our legislature would just decide to fix the problem, but so far they haven't. Um, and the second question then, which has affected the whole of constitutional law is, can a worker not rely on the Labor Relations Act, but just rely on the constitutional right to strike, for example, or to join a trade union? And the court has said very firmly, no, you may not. There's a principle of constitutional subsidiarity. You must go through the Labor Relations legislation. And of course, the importance of that is not only to create coherence, but also to re respect, as it were, the legislative right to give effect to the rights and not to create two tiers of or two uh, fora for uh, dispute resolution. And thirdly, there's a, a, a been a difficulty which pretty well every uh, uh, democratic system faces, which is how to calibrate the judicial scrutiny of the decisions of specialist tribunals. This has been an issue in the United Kingdom, I know. In South Africa, basically the approach the court has said is that where you're talking about a tribunal, the court will give it a lot of respect, but its decision must be one that a reasonable decision maker could reach in the light of the constitutional rights. So these are a whole range of cases. And if you look at the cases that have come before the court, I would say the vast majority have been what I would call loosely coherence cases. But there have been cases too, which have been directly on issues in relation to the right to strike. Here the court has been very firm that the, where the legislation is open to different interpretations, interpretations must be adopted which are consistent with section 3023 of the constitution, which contains the right to strike. But one of the difficult questions is, our constitution is formulated so that the right, all the rights may be limited by law of, of general application as long as the limitation is justifiable. And the question that is, the court has had to grapple with is, do we interpret it assuming that this is a limitation or not assuming it's a limitation? And the court has come to the view that if a party wants to argue that we should be interpreting the legislation in a manner that limits rights, the party coming before us carries the heavy burden of establishing that, that that limited understanding of the right to strike is the one that ought to be adopted. So in a whole range of cases, the court has upheld the right to strike, the right to strike of minority unions, for example, in relation to the demand for organizational rights, in relation to creating a narrow definition of essential services where there's a prohibition on the right to strike, in relation to strike notices. And all of these cases have been interpreted in the light of Section 23, where there's been some openness in the language of the Labor Relations Act. But there are clear limits on the right to strike as well. So, for example, in 2013, the court had to deal with a case where the legislature had enacted a piece of legislation saying that where an organization organizes a gathering and is a uh, to, has uh, foresight or realizes that there's a prospect that the gathering will result in damage, they must take reasonable steps to minimize the damage. And this, uh, the trade union challenged this legislation on the gr grounds that they were being held liable for damage caused by a public protest action in Cape Town. And the court did not declare the legislation invalid, but upheld it and said that it was an important balance between the rights of organizers, participants on the one hand, and the vulnerable and helpless victims of a gathering on the other. Most of the victims of the gatherings in Cape Town are informal traders whose, whose shops and so on are destroyed as the protesters move past. So in these two examples, I hope I've illustrated the complexity of um, the uh, idea of constitutionalizing labor rights, but also that it's not necessarily a bad idea. I think that the 
idea of coherence in the system is a very valuable one. It's a very long, fuller, very rule of law sort of idea, but I think it's been a very important one for South Africa. Um, and I also think that the importance that the court has uh, emphasized on the importance of the right to strike uh, has, been, has been important for trade unions um, in the last 20 years. There is a third role, which I think is the tricky one the court is going to have to deal with, and that is in the big policy making area around the challenges I've mentioned, unemployment and inequality. How much space should the court give to a democratically elected legislature to seek to address problems of, of, um, of unemployment and inequality uh, in terms of limiting rights? And I think that is a challenge that is almost certainly the court is going to have to to, um, to meet in the next decade. So in conclusion then, at the end of your turbulent week, I think, I hope I've illustrated that we too have our turbulent challenges in South Africa. And that for lawyers very often, this idea of uh, focusing on the key principles, recognizing the importance of the rule of law and of human rights is, is very important in times of turbulence. Doesn't make one feel a lot better always, but it is a very important project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. Um, from your moving uh, personal tributes to Bob through to your descriptions of some historical descriptions of the uh, landscape in South Africa to those very telling points about the Constitution as a kind of standard against which rights can be fixed and even touching on the policy issues that might move those was, was for all of us re really interesting. Thank you. Um, we were privileged to hear that. Um, and it's a pleasure that it's so, so well ranged across the interests of the two organizations that have come together tonight to host this evening. Um, I'm going to move on for just a few seconds and then I'm not going to keep us from our supper. I just wanted to thank you all for being here. I particularly wanted to appreciate Mary Cousy, um, Bob's widow, who's here with us today and who's worked with him, who's a, a shining uh, um, uh, intellectual in the world of equality on, in her own right and who's written a great deal on this. And I also wanted to say again how ple pleasant it was to have another member of Bob's family here with us in Joshua. Um, this, is, this has been one of those wonderful evenings which I think none of us will forget. Um, through the generosity of Deckards, anything uh, that, 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 the, uh, the, that we have been able to um, have some funds come to us tonight to be allocated to the internship program that, that we run in Bob's name and which enables um, people, I don't want to call them young, people at the start of work in the human rights arena to get a toehold in this, in this world which is both wonderful and actually extremely difficult difficult um, to get into and it's, a, it's an intern, internship program, an unusually paid internship program which the, the Equal Rights Trust is very proud to run. On our website are some little snippets of some of our interns and uh, what this has done for them. So it's been, again I want to say thank you to um, Deckerts in particular and Cloisters too for making it possible for us to be able to promote that. The last thing I want to say to you tonight, if I may, is just a little bit about the ERT, and this is partly because I want to ask people to shake a bucket at you as you go out. I'm not going to be um, uh, crude about this. Well, I am crude about this. I'm not going to be ashamed about it. We do work which is important to be done. Um, we're small but we do important work. In the last year, for example, we've been working with human rights defenders in dangerous environments. A lot of it I can't talk to you about, but a small example is work that we've done providing technical and financial support to human rights defenders in Yemen, reporting on doubly disadvantaged people, discriminated against people, and people being bombed in a war zone. We have worked to build the capacity and knowledge of those working on equality issues around the world. In the last year, we have trained more than 700 activists in a dozen different countries. We're tiny. This year, we've worked with the Federation of Women Lawyers in Kenya and 33 community-based organizations providing training, guidance, and legal advice to assist them in giving legal services to more than 1,300 women staggering, experiencing gender-based violence and other forms of discrimination. I'm so sorry, I, talk, I, I always talk too far. Sorry, Lauren. Um, 1,300 women experiencing gender discrimination, gender-based violence, and other forms of discrimination. International level, we've recently submitted 
a collective complaint against discriminatory benefit laws in Bulgaria to the European Committee on Social Rights, and have worked with our Moldovan partner to take a complaint to the Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, focused on the death of a woman um, uh, from being killed by her husband. With other members of the Global Campaign for Equal Nationality Rights, with which some of you will be familiar in this room, we have helped to raise awareness of the issue of gender discriminatory nationality laws at the United Nations. At the national level, <clears throat> our advocacy and our work to support advocacy by others has led to growing consensus on the need for equality law reforms in countries ranging, albeit not alphabetically, from Moldova to Madagascar. And from, for example, we're proud that partly through work we were involved with, Ukraine adopted the very first law in its history explicitly prohibiting discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. I could go on, but I just want to end with a plea. We're a tiny organization with a huge mission. One of the vagaries of, of uh, the funding for human rights work is that you get funded for 90% of anything you want to do. So we always have to find the other 10%. So if we get £10 from you, that funds £100 of work. If we get £20, it funds £200 of work, and so on. So it's challenging to get funding, but it's particularly challenging to find the extra 10%. That's all I'll say now. I'm very grateful to you all for being here. Thank you, and thank you again, especially to Anna and Kate. Supper. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.